You've had Wendy's Nugs dipped in sauce, but have you had them covered in sauce? Wendy's new Saucy Nugs take the crispy and spicy nugs you love and turn them up to 11. Choose between flavors like buffalo or honey barbecue, garlic parm, or if you're a real heat seeker out there, you can try spicy ghost pepper only on Wendy's signature spicy nugs. Listen, I'm going to dare you to do it. I dare you. That's seven delicious ways to try the nugs that you already love. Pick a flavor, grab some extra napkins, and then grab a few more napkins and prepare to nug like you've never nugged before. For a whole new way to nug, it's got to be Wendy's at participating U.S. Wendy's. From the hills of Strawberry Canyon, I'm Coin Dang, and this is the Golden Bear Cast. Let's go, go Bears! Yeah, so that's where we're at. Let's move to the audience, to the attendance. The game day atmosphere. Game day atmosphere. Okay, Throw back so to the old pod. Let me uh, let me ask you this: How did you feel about like just being back there? I know we talked about it a lot, but I want it like for on the record on the pod of just like being there with all those fans, the tailgates happening, the students in attendance, like the fans around, campus buzzing, like just that. Yeah, I mean, it was packed. It was cool. The vi- I mean, it was back. It was back in all ways. It was so awesome. And a shout out to Sam Pack and his Hoduck. I suppose to say that right. Yeah, this is well, similar enough. Hotcakes, <laughs> Korean hotcakes. <laughs> Korean hotcakes. <laughs> and uh, they are delicious. Loved it. It was great to see everybody. Got my right for Cal sweatshirt. You did. Shout out to. Uh, Twist and Hook for sponsoring those and Rob and the team for making those happen. It was awesome. I mean, I, it was great. It was great to be back. It was great to be out and about. It was a shit ton of people. You deal with all the anxiety that comes from being back in a group of people. But, hey, after going to a 40,000-person Giants game on Sunday, <laughs> I don't think anything can phase me anymore. I'm fully back. But... No, it was great, and I felt like that you could just tell on campus that there was a lot of really good energy, a lot of gold. Uh, you kind of forget about all the T-shirt giveaways being gold and gold out, and um, it was just a really good, really good experience. What about you? I I think the same. I think, um, you know, it's it was that moment of like, wow, like we're back here. It's been over. It's been over a year. It's been two years, basically, since we've been at Memorial for a game, right? Because the last time we were there was November of 2019. So it was it was nice. It was surreal. I did have, like, a little emotional moment, you know, just because for the people that know, like me or, or any of us, like, we lost two guys from our group of friends, like, over the year. Um, you know, we lost Mikey Toledo, and we lost uh, Larry, who's one of one of the best writers we've ever seen in the Cal space. Um, so it was, it was just a, a pseudo emotional day um, being there, not having them around. Um, but like just the, the energy levels around the, the tailgates, the people, the, you know, we have a tail, we have our tailgate spot and um, the tailgate spots that like the other tailgates that are around us, it's, it was like cool seeing the same people, right? You know, like we, they, uh, some of the guys walked over to the other tailgates and was like, oh, so glad to see that you're back. And you get that community atmosphere back, you know, and that's something that we've been missing with all this social distancing and, and the pandemic over the last few years. And, you know, as a side reminder, if you haven't gotten vaccinated, please get vaccinated so we can continue to do this and not worry about not having this. Uh, but, Man. Please go, please go please, do that, please. Please, um, you know, I got a text from someone saying that there was eight K students in attendance today or that night. That was awesome. 
like, you know how we've been clamoring about, you know, the student section not being in full force and not being available. And now we know now all we need is a pandemic to reboot the student section to get it to where it used to be. And that's where we'll be. You know, the stadium was actually a lot more full than I expected it to be full. And we don't get to see what the chair backs look like because we're sitting above it. Right. But we we see the rest of the stadium. And it's like, oh, this is this is not bad. Like this is better than I expected. Um, and getting the, the, the chills were like the moment where you where they're singing the national anthem and you hear the and the rockets blue glare, you know, gold, the sp- star spangled ba- star spangled banner, um, the the hey alumni go bears on three, the C A L. What does that what does that spell? Like just hearing the the those chants reverberating throughout the stadium. And cause we get this in the press box, but you know, because of COVID and all that, all the windows are up. So you, you get like every single sound wave just running through your body of all of those people saying the same thing. And it's been a year and a half, two years since we've heard that. And so like it, honestly, I'm not going to lie, man. It, it gave me feelings of my first game at Memorial back in 2007. Like, you know, granted it's not the same amount of people, but it's just that 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 feeling of like, whoa, like that many people in unison saying the same thing, like you know, like this is what we're here for. It was it was it was surreal. It was incredible. Like that that the emotions and the like my feeling right before kickoff was just, man, we made it. Like we we made it here, and we're doing this thing, and we're on this journey. For whatever it was, I mean, we 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 fell out what the Nevada journey was, but we're still on this journey for another few months. So it's uh, it was just one of those one of those nights. All right, so that's the positive. <laughs> now, what do you, what effect do you think, if any, that game had on those in attendance? Oh, we're so screwed. Oh, we're so screwed. I mean, look. The, the Cal student section tweeted out that they sold all of their combo passes, right? Which means they sold out their student tickets. That's like a combo for football and men's basketball. How many they sold, we don't know. Um, but I'm assuming it's enough to at least sell out the bench, right? So, which is the not just the student section at Memorial, but also at Haas Pavilion. So, with all that, I don't know. I Like... Especially because your next game is away at TCU and it's on TV. I don't think it's going to be enough. I think I think we can blow out TCU and we'll still come back and people won't be at the Sac State game at 1 p.m. I, I just don't see it. That's just my thoughts. I just don't see it happening. This I, I was telling a bunch of people like I emotionally this felt like the ASU game from 2019. And those were different circumstances, right? Because we lost Chase during that game and then we had to put in a backup. And the the narrative of that game was drastically different. But the ultimate end was the same, which was we came into this game hyped. People were hyped. Everyone was hyped. But the football didn't entertain. And we ended up in a loss to the point where people were this in this game to the point where people were booing. <laughs> the people were booing our team <laughs> off the field <laughs> on possession changes. And I don't know if you can bring that back. If they had, if they were booing the team, man, like that's a, that's a bridge you can't cro- come back from. It's crossed. The first game. The first, first, game. Game. <laughs> the first freaking game. I don't know if you can come back from that. That's so funny. It's so sad. But so funny. It's... <laughs> Like, first so, game back. So here's <laughs> it was loud, dude. It was not quiet. It was loud. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> you heard the. You, everyone heard it. It wasn't just like a patch of people. It was like no less. It was full, on. full on booze. Like, and you know that started from the old blues because everyone that bought those combo passes got to be freshman sophomore. So yeah. it's like old blues are out there like boo. <laughs> Everyone joins in. This is stadiums raining down booze on these guys. <laughs> and like the thing, the thing with it too, right? It's I, so I don't think anyone's expectation going into this game was like we're national contenders. Like we're gonna blow this team out of the water. Like we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be emphatic. 
and and get this this win right yeah like, i don't think that's the expectation that everyone had i think the expectation under that was just we're a good team we can beat out a non-power five team at home in our first game back with fans like i think that was the expectation right no one had no one had loftier expectations like I said that we would draw 55, but like if you're taking me seriously and me saying that we're going to draw 55 in that prediction post, like I said it in all caps and I said, let's get crazy. Like I, I wasn't being rational. It was the, I'm, I'm like being hyped and it's game one. So, so all that being said, as a performance, you have to have severely under, under, under delivered to the general like fans that were in the stands that day. To be that booed out. And I am yeah. not I am not for the boos. I don't think I don't think we should have booed. I don't think they should have booed. I would have told people not to boo if I was in the stands. But I can understand why they were booing. And that's it's not I mean, dude, Dodgers fans booed Kenley Jansen off the field, and the guy is their all time saves leader with like 350 <laughs> career <laughs> saves for the franchise. Like, if they're going to boo that, then damn, yeah, that offense, you'd be like, oh, yeah, they're over, well overdue for a booing. No, I mean, I agree. They're collegiate athletes. Like, they're kids, man. So they're student athletes. And, you know, I, if maybe they were just yelling, like, boo, Musgrave, boo. <laughs> <laughs> like, to me, you can boo the – yeah, you can boo the coaches. Yeah. It's really what it is. But, yeah, to, I mean, to be booed off the field – I. <sighs> You just get the sense that people weren't looking for us to necessarily win that game as though we were supreme favorites because it was a toss up. If you yep. look at the line, it's a toss up. They were just looking for the offense to not be abysmal. Right. And what did we give them? Abysmal. So, fun stuff. Great, great first impression for, for the students. But good thing they're locked into the combo plan. They're locked in. <laughs> They're locked in with their hundred dollars. And this is your first lesson of college. Ah, uh, lovely. I, let's go to some. Uh, let's go to questions. questions. You want to go to questions? Do you have anything else yeah. to talk about the game before we move on? I feel like we talked about a lot of negatives. We talked about a lot of like issues. Just to end on a little bit of a positive note, were there any positive takeaways for you? Yeah, I'll try to do a handful. Damian Moore looked every bit the part of the running back that I've been touting to friends and anyone who will listen for mm -hmm. the last year. He breaks tackles, got good vision, and then you throw into Carlos Brooks and hey, Christopher Brooks. And Christopher Brooks. We have a running attack that can be pretty effective and and will continue to be effective. And we have the line to run behind. We've had the running attack in the past. But we just never really had as much like we had the line as well. Like we don't get me wrong. We had good linemen, but I felt like we started to build a little bit of a better pass protection rather than like maulers that will enable the run. Yeah. We have more of an offensive line that can actually engage with the run and be a run dominant team. By all means, that could be the blueprint, the Wisconsin blueprint that Wilcox has really been trying to follow, I think. And so hopefully we're there. So that's a really big positive. Man, I was going for a handful. <sighs> uh, let me let me stick in with one as you okay. continue your thoughts. I honestly think the defense did not have a bad game. I'm a firm believer that the, if you take the defense in isolation and you look at their stats and what they did against Carson Strong, who is, tout, who is being touted as NFL talent and that offense that is being touted as very explosive – they did exactly what they were supposed to do. Granted, there were some moments and there were some issues, right? I think a lot of people took issue with uh, the, you know, Colin Gamble not having his best debut at Memorial Stadium. Um, but, and the defensive line maybe not getting enough pressure on the quarterback. But I yep. think they did enough. They held this team to just 22 points. I think their worst game last year offensively for Nevada that Nathan was talking about was that Hawaii game. And I think in the Hawaii game, they scored 21. So they, they kept them at bay to exactly what you needed to do. Right. Yeah. They got 
pretty lucky along the way. I mean, I don't I wouldn't want to name I didn't want to talk about Gamble today. It, it, he he just had he was just getting destroyed. I think he got benched. So we yeah. believe that he well, was Luke benched. Lockett we weren't able to confirm yeah, it towards the end of the game for him. So and yeah, he just looked lost on so many of those routes and just flailing. It and just was bad. It was a bad look, man. And that wasn't and, an athleticism issue. Like we know how I know how good he is, like athletically. That was just a, I think just, just brain farts. Just as like the game progressed, I mean, it's, you can see Elijah Hicks coming over yelling at him, but he wasn't getting into the right spots. Yeah. And and you know it's just you could tell senior the senior guys on the team were were frustrated about it. It was just all right, positives, positives. Uh, <laughs> but as a whole, I think the defense did did enough. I think defense played well. I thought Coyne had a couple good plays. He had one really, really impressive arm tackle. Yep. Uh, the Luke Beckett sack was, or I think, yeah, the Luke Beckett sack was pretty cool. The to see. He had one other play was it that the he, Tevis tech or the, I think it was he had, a, he had a, Beckett had a sack of his own. And then he also had the play where Tevis grabbed him and yep. Beckett finished him off. Yeah. But Luke played really well in his, in his return and just super cool to see him back on the team. So I think that was a positive the, I don't know. I mean, special teams was pretty much not the same as last year, but Nico was as dynamic as a returner. Mm-hmm. You could really see that. I was actually frust- I was frustrated that he kept fair catching the ball. I thought like he could actually return some of those, but they're such dangerous plays that I tend to be happy that they don't do them. But he's so damn dynamic that... I honestly, with the first couple of returns, like he was a maybe a missed tackle away from really breaking something totally loose. So Nico was super dynamic. The first two drives were great. They showed what this offense could be in some weird situation where we're able to do that for a full game, like the full potential of what a pro style offense could be and what that would look like. I mean, there's plenty of positives, but at the same time, I think just because of the the nature of the second, third, and most of the fourth quarter. <sighs> harder harder to find those than you'd ideally like. And you can't really say the special teams, like, you know, the missed field goal. But Longhetto, he, like, he did well. Like, the other one was a nice make. But I just overall have a really sour taste in my mouth on any of these positives that I'm saying right now. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um... Yeah, I think I think that's that's enough <laughs> of that. I don't think uh we needed to uh, go any deeper. But we do have a lot of questions today. So let's run through some of those, shall we? Shall begin first one with our friend Josh, a writer at Right for Cal, friend of the pod. What shocked you the most about Saturday night? About how, how about the, the caveat on this question is not the offense, right? We've talked about that enough. So, did you have any others? Yeah, I just was shocked about how fast I could go from casually being like, we're going to win seven games this year, take it easy, to, wow, we have a chance to be the best team in the conference, and then, oh my gosh, we're terrible again. Like, that <laughs> roller coaster just wasn't... <laughs> wasn't aware that I had the the capability of it was a 15 of minute riding roller, that roller coaster. It was a 15 minute roller coaster, right? Cuz it was 50, it was the first quarter. You went into that you went into that 7 to 5 mindset at kickoff. And then after the first quarter you were like, "Oh my god, we could be the best. We could win the Pac-12 North this year." <laughs> and then halfway through the second quarter, like after our second drive that stalls again, you're like, "Oh my god, we're garbage." <laughs> and there and there you have it. What about you, Rob? Shocked me the most. Um, can I go like an, a non football one? Yeah. That you telling me that ham sandwich is good, and I had <laughs> I had to have that ham sandwich, <laughs> and it was not a good ham sandwich. That's where that's the, well, that's what shocked me. That's what shocked this me. is such this is <laughs> such slander. Uh I don't even want to get to say this. <laughs> what was it? Soup and ladle, ladle and something, ladle and leaf, ladle and leaf used to cater for the press box. No, 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 this is no, the most. No, it wasn't. It was um, it was uh, booting, boating. B- before that, 
It was ladle and leaf. Oh, before that, it was ladle leaf. Okay. Ladle leaf. Then it was boudin. Then it was and cal, now it di- is cal dining. Cal dining. Ladle and leaf was terrible mm-hmm. with some outside hits. But if you wanted to eat something good, you ate the hot dog. And now that you know hot dogs take about 40 minutes off of your life, do you really want to be eating one of those anyways? So that's if you want to go for it, go for the hot dog. Then you get into boudin. Boudin sandwich, the bread is garbage. Everything about it, whack. Then we finally have someone who's trying. They're putting forth their best effort. They even put banana peppers into it. And they used Dutch crunch that wasn't old bread like the other sandwiches that we have. And they gave us a delicious, perfectly baked cookie with kettle chips that were delicious. Miss Vicky's, great brand. All inside a nice little box. (laughs) And I said that that sandwich was good. I stand by it. I went and got it. The cookie, I will say the best part about that box was the cookie. That, cookie was elite. That like white, the white chocolate with like, was it like cranberry cookie? That cookie was elite. That cookie was S tier. <laughs> I haven't so had that good. good of a cookie in a while. That was a really good cookie. <laughs> All things considered, like that thing was in a box for God knows how long. And it was still like crumbly, like soft. Like, I don't know how like it didn't like harden in its, you know, hours sitting in a box in the corner of the press floor. So sounds like your sandwich, however, did you know? <laughs> did have that journey. <laughs> sandwich is not as good as I expected. But that's that was my shock. Andy usually Andy's like uh you know, with food with Andy and I when we like go out to eat, Andy's spot on. This was the one time where I trusted Andy. The <laughs> very first time where I trusted Andy on a decision of food and it did not pay off. It did not pay off. But the cookie was amazing. Uh we move to the next one. Uh I'm going to butcher his name or her name, but uh, Shavit Karen. It's Karen. It's K-E-K-E-R-E-N. Wilcox tracking like the guy for five to seven or or five, seven and seven and five teams. Is the Cal fan base okay with that long term? And should we be? Hmm. What do you think? Should we be? No. Because I think you should always be striving to be better. I think, uh, you know, like Conzo, Con, you know, uh, Conzo Martin, uh, Conzo Martin's thing, like when he came to Cal and what he, what they asked him about, like what he wants to accomplish here. And his immediate answer was, we want to win a national championship. Like that, that was like his first thing off the bat. Right. And whether that's just like PR say or whatever it is, but the fact that you're able to say that, at like a place like Cal that hasn't won basketball national championships in over 50 years, like, and you know, like putting forth that effort into saying that is the ultimate goal we want to reach here. And that is the pinnacle of like our athletic progress. That's kind of what we want to strive for. Should we, should, should our foot head football coach say, we're going to try and win the national championship every year. I don't think that's realistic, but someone that strives to get to that point is probably who we want. Right, not someone who settles for being a seven and five or eight and four team perennially. Um, so, should we be no if he is the five and seven or or to seven and five type of coach? I don't know if the Cal va- Cal fan base is okay with that long term. I think uh, remember when we said like as long as Cal is a perennial bowl team, we'll be all right with it. Yeah, but I I, I my my devil's advocate thing to that is you're always going to want something better. So like if we're always going six and six and we're going to a bowl game every year, we finish the season six and uh, seven and six at some point, we're going to be like, we deserve eight wins. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So, but I I think the, (laughs) I agree. I just think it's about building the foundation. So I'm still in the mindset of saying, yes, if you're going seven and five with a shot at winning eight games every year, which you and I said, we're totally happy with it. Yeah. The issue is not, the issue is that people don't want one of those five losses to be against Nevada <laughs> in a game that we should have won. And that's, that's the difference. It's like, I don't think the number side, if you look at the numbers of seven and five with a potential eight and five season, and you're doing that every single year, well, you're kind of knocking on the doorstep of taking that step. But what teams don't do is go like five and seven 
to like 10 and two. Right. It just it doesn't really happen like that unless you have this freakishly, you know, senior class that kind of develops and you sh- run on the scene. But I, it, you know, we're trying to follow the Utah model here, which is go to the bowl game every single year, build the foundation, build this, the sustained success and expectations behind it. And then once you have that, then try to take the next step from there. And, the issue actually is that the coaches have been the ones that have been saying, we're going to take that step. This is, you know, they're the ones that are sort of prepping us to be like, oh, great. It's time. Awesome. It's time. And then you lose to Nevada and everyone's like, what the hell? You told me it was time. I thought it was time. Damn it. You know, I think, I think there's definitely questions out there. If you have, I, you need to get a specific, there's certain players that will also enable you to take that step. Mm-hmm. And right now, I don't know if I see those players on our team to get to a nine and three, to get to a 10 and two, but we're not far from it based on a recruiting classes of having the capabilities of getting there. There's guys coming into this program, man, Justin Martin, dude, if he holds firm and comes through, like, you're gonna have, you're gonna have guys that are now in this program, and then also at running back, wide receiver, skill positions, offensively, defensively, D line, like this team can take that next step. You just gotta be okay with losing to Nevada right now. <laughs> it's like we're just not, and like that's fine. I get it. Like we wanted, we should have won that game, and it's super frustrating. It's just at the end of the day, is part of the calculus, and it sucks. It is what it is. And, I mean, I think I think the the broken down version of what Andy is trying to say is that seven and five perennially, there's nuance to it. Right? It's not just a flat out seven and five. My yes. my concern with going seven and five is the new my nuance to that seven and five is the conference and out of conference splits. So if he's if Wilcox is winning all three of his out of conference games every year, right? And that that accounts to the seven and five, so that means we're only winning four conference games every year. Am I okay with that? Probably not, because I'd much rather lose out of conference games, and be more successful against the teams that I play every single year, year in year out. And mm-hmm. that's the, I think that's the next step this team needs to make. I don't think it's a I don't think it's a a win loss at end of the season. Like if let's say let's say we lose all three of our out of conference games and we go on a undefeated streak in the Pac-12 conference, right? In hindsight, I'm going to be like, "Yeah, we could have we could have gotten one more win with Nevada, but I am perfectly fine with this because we just tore through our yearly competition and we wrecked them." So that's that's my like nuanced caveat about like 7 and 5 or 5 and 7. Because, like, think about it. Like, if we let's if we went five and seven, right? We lost all three of our out of conference games, but we won five, five conference games and lost four. Like, then it's like, oh yeah, if we had just gotten that one more, co- one more out of conference game to boost it. But I'm, I don't think we can go five and seven. To be honest, I don't think Wilcox could sustain two years, two straight years of five and seven. But if it's six and six, like the bowl game, yeah. You go one and three, or let's say you go one and two, not out of conference, and then five wins in conference, and you're six and six. Yeah, man. Exactly. I think you take it. Yeah. I think you absolutely take it. That's where we're at. All right. Uh, we got one from the uh, on Twitter. Counselor says, anybody still worried about Wilcox running off to Nebraska? And I think that's pointed at you specifically. Ah. And I did tweet at him saying that... Uh, we would, um, I would have you on, you're the lead witness, and I would have you on the stand to answer this question. <laughs> First of all, it's a hot take pod for a, a preview pod for a reason, <laughs> so let's just remember that. But, I mean, my negative predictions, that was my one of my secret negative positive predictions. I don't know. It's, 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 there's a lot of season left. <laughs> I talk to me after four games. If we're three and one, having just beat Washington, TCU, and Sacramento State, 
I think Nebraska's looking at Wilcox and saying, yeah. But if we're <laughs> owned for, they're probably being like, hell no. I mean, realistically, no, I'm not worried about Wilcox going to Nebraska. I think he's in here for the long haul, and I, I would be shocked to see him leave. I don't know what he could say that Cal is limiting him, that he could do something different at Nebraska that he could do here. I, I just don't believe that that's the case, and so I don't really see the the move, and they'll probably want to go towards a more offensive-minded head coach. Um they, I'd be more concerned if I was a Nevada fan about Jay Norvell or however you say his name being poached mm. by a bigger program after what I saw because Carson Strong was unbelievable. That dude, that's a crazy talent, NFL talent. Those receivers are super good. That offense was intricate and exciting. And if I was in Nebraska after dealing with Scott Frost and however the hell that didn't work out, I'd want to bring in someone that would get the fan base excited. I think you're right. Offense, offense tends to do that. All right, moving on to the next question. Kisk, uh, 075 or 075. Why does Bill Musgrave hate me? That's all you, Rob. That is... I believe Bill Musgrave is available for confession on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if you want to go into the confession booth and talk to him then... I believe he'll give you your answer, but that's not a, that's, I can't. When's press, when's press availability for Musgrave? Musgrave should be, no, coach is, I think Wilcox is tomorrow. I think uh, Musgrave is Wednesday if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So we we should have a presser from him on Wednesday. That'll be the one to watch Mm -hmm. to answer that question. Yep. Uh, Next one from Myla. She asks quite a few questions. So we'll go with the top. Uh, we'll work our way. Why didn't the Cal band perform before the game? I heard rumors, but I don't, I can't, they're unsubstantiated, so I can't say it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the exact reason. I mean, I know they performed on Sproul. I know that for sure. Um, Look, shot in the dark, COVID, right? Shot in the, Probably. Shot in the dark is, <laughs> shot in the dark isn't that like a Cal band member got COVID or anything like that. It's just, Shot in the dark is to minimize the amount of people that are on the field, like right. going through opposing players and, you know, current players to in limit tunnel. In, in that tunnel and on the field. Right. Because they're like warming up and stuff, usually on the sidelines to eliminate all of that. And they're limiting the amount of people that are in there. And that's and that's not just the bad stuff. Like there's limited amount of press that are available to be on the field during games. And and so on. So I think they're just they're just trying to. I think it's a game day, just limiting um, with COVID procedure. That's all it is. Why aren't there any cheerleaders? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> no clue. Um, also, they're called the Dance Squad. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, I think right. We don't have cheerleaders well, at the, Cal. We have Dance Squad. Well, the, the the like the spirit dance team that like sits on in that overflow section. They were there. But we didn't have like our normal cheerleaders that are on the sidelines. And maybe once again, maybe that's a COVID thing. Maybe that's a protocol thing of like not having students on the field unless you're staff or part of the team. Yeah, that's just an educated guess. Um, why do the coaches think a 14 point lead is enough so early in the game against a team with a high scoring offense? I guess what they're trying to ask is like, why did we take the foot off the pedal after we scored 14? Why do we turtle, Rob? Why do we turtle? Honestly, I don't think we turtled. Like, to be totally honest, I think it was more of an execution and deciding what, like, plays were working. We didn't straight up turtle. Like, we didn't straight up just, like, we're just going to hand the ball off and just go for, like, one or two yards and just try to eat up clock as much as possible, like in prior years. We actually tried to take shots. We actually tried to pass the ball. What shots did we take? Well, I'm I'm saying like we had pass plays. Like we weren't, we weren't turtling like in our, in the traditional, like old school sense is what I'm trying to say. I agree. I'm just giving you a hard time. I know you are. But I don't think, I don't think we took any shots. (laughs) It was an advanced, it was an advanced undercover turtle. (laughs) It looked like we weren't turtling, but we basically did the same thing. The end, The end result was a turtling, but the process wasn't. Like a turtling process. Yeah. That's basically what we came down to. 
Why did we give up the run game when it was going so well? This is her final question. I don't see. I, so it's, this is a weird toss up because I think we did abandon the run game in the sense of establishing it as like our strength to set up other things. But we didn't go away full like looking back at the at the play by play breakdown. We didn't go fully away from the run game. Like we went back to it when we thought it would be effective. We just we just didn't use it all the time. And I'd have to actually go back to the game tape to figure out why they weren't running. Were they stacking the box? Like, you know, like, did we only run when they when we felt like they weren't going to stack the box? I don't know. I have to go back and look at the tape. Yeah, I mean, I think that the abandonment of the run, the it was very clear to the fans' eye, to all of us there, that the advantage was Cal running the ball, and the numbers batched it up. There were a couple of stops where we went first, you know, got two yard gains or no gains on first down, and we didn't go back to it. We also didn't do things that would have been necessarily like. I think more interesting, like you could run a halfback draw on second down after getting stuffed and, you know, the defense then can't, I mean, they're going to drop back as if it's a pass play. So you're going to open up more space. So I, I think that there was opportunity to be more creative while still sticking with the run than we chose to do. And we chose to do that because of whatever belief we have that if you apparently only gain two yards on second down that you have to pass. And I don't think that's true. The data doesn't support it based on, you know, the statistical averages and how we were doing and the personnel that we had and the advantage in the matchup. So I think for me, it was frustrating to see us go away from that. Cal's bread and butter and Wilcox's bread and butter and Wisconsin's bread and butter, which once again, we'll bring up, I feel like is the model that we're going after is really that, you know, um, it's the ability of running the ball down people's throats and not needing a quarterback to kind of carry you. And we, I think we had that opportunity here, but we just instead tried to give it back to the quarterback. And uh, I don't mean that in a negative way about the quarterback. It's just, just what we chose to do. And you might say, hey, that was a senior leader that we had and uh, on the, you know, makes more sense to go with the seniority and stuff like that. Or maybe there's a higher risk with running the ball or fumble or something. I'm not really sure. But if it were me, instead of the balanced approach that you mentioned, Rob, I would have preferred maybe like more of like a 60-40, 65-35 run to pass run to set up the pass run to set up the play action we did not do that and that probably cost us the game i think i, I mean we've we talked about this like to you know not to not to continue this this conversation but i think like the more i think about it and more i sit on the game and what i saw and once again i have to go back and look at the tape which i'll probably do you know over the next two days but what I'm saying, what my point is, is like we went away from the run game because I think I'm looking at it more rationally now, right? Like after our two drives, our run game was so effective that they started to spotlight on our run game, right? Which is why we kind of went more pass heavy to to combat that. Sure. Okay. Adjustment made. But when they started to adjust to that and be able to take away what we want to do in the pass game, we instead, instead of going back to the run game, we kind of decided to keep sticking with the pass, right? And trying to force that issue with the pass game. Then what I think what a lot of fans are saying, but look at the fourth quarter and like that, you know, the the Christopher Brooks run, uh, the Chris, the DeCarlos Brooks run and the, uh, and the Damian Moore run and all those moments that got us all the way down into field goal range, right? Those were all run plays. And I think, once again, I'm going to have to look at the tape because I don't have the evidence to back this up, but... I think the reason we went back to the run there was because we were seeing things from them defensively that they were trying to take away our pass game and the running lanes opened up again. Like it, it opened up space in the box and, and outside. So if that was the case, then the play calling was actually, that actually might have been right. It might have been that we were running the ball when we saw defensive sets that would have given us the advantage in the run. 
and we were passing, but maybe we passed a little bit too much. And then we went back to the run when we saw defensive sets that was advantageous to us again, and which is why it was effective. That would just be my rational, like, A to B to C, like, trend. Once again, I have to go back and look at the tape to figure this out. <laughs> uh, but that would just be my, my like, step back and take my emotion out of it and look at why we decided to go from away from the run and then back to it later. Well said. I think that's rational enough without emotion. Our last question comes from Scott Marina on Twitter. What is your evaluation of Chase Garbers' performance? I did not see evident improvement in pass selection, and he still seems fearful of slinging the deep ball. Is the complexity of Musgrave's offense too much for Chase, or is he just limited based on talent? We go as Chase goes, dot, dot, dot. You want to take first stab at this? <laughs> sure. I mean, I think we've, we're have we at the point now where we're probably talking about it too much, but what I would say with the last part of that tweet, I think is just spot on. That's Wilcox has tied himself. We go as we go as chase goes. That's it. I, <laughs> that's what we have chosen to do. And I don't know. And it kind of ties into the question before that regarding the run game and decisions we've made. We go as chase goes. I think that chase does have hesitancies to throw deep balls. We talked about why that might be the case because Wilcox is so intent about winning the turnover margin and making sure that they win that battle because the team that wins the turnover battle more often than not wins the game. And so I think that's part of, partly coaching, partly chase. If you look at, uh, you know, some of the mistakes he made, the spike, you know, him coming, what he talks about in the press conference and coming off his hand, admitting it's a bad throw. Dude, the guy's smart. He's humble. He, he's... You know, he's good, as you said, Rob, like he's totally capable enough to get us to where we want to go as a fan base. I mean, he's willing he's willing to talk about his faults and he's willing to admit that, like, those are his faults. Right. He's not talking about scheme. He's not talking about like, oh, the defensive lineman like ran into me and like he's not making excuses. Like in the, in the press conference, he straight up just said it was it was a bad throw on my part and I got to be better. Like and I honestly, I don't know. You can't follow up that question. Like when you ask that to Chase, like if he's saying it's his fault, no. like what are you going to say? Like, can you explicitly tell me what part of that fault it is? Like, is it your index finger on the ball? Like which part? He's like, no, it's, it's my fault. Like what, what? How do you follow up to that? If he's taking responsibility for it, then golf clap and say that's a mature way to handle a press conference and you move on. Yeah. And I think we just got to wait till next week. He, I think he just starts slow. I think he does. He really do. He just starts slow. The game comes fast. And as and like with my own progression uh -huh. as an athlete, things start to slow down the more and more you play it. Like for me in match play with tennis, I used to play tennis super competitively, been playing a lot recently. And what started to happen, I started to notice the game is slowing down for me. So the set, like set play, being in the middle of it, now, all of a sudden, I'm able to jump out in front of a volley or poach a ball much faster, much more effectively. I'm getting more depth on my shots. Why? The game is slowing down because I'm putting myself in that situation. So let's go all the way back to the beginning. How many times has he been in that situation? Live offense, live defense, not your teammates that you see all the time that are coming at you. And we're looking at it as someone that probably just needs four games. And after four games, if we're still here, yeah, I'll be the first person to say might not be working out. But until we sort of hit that threshold, I'm going to do my best this year for the first time ever to practice patience. <laughs> <laughs> and not hot take it every week. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're I think you're spot on. I think the there is from our perspective, I think there is a slight fear of throwing the deep ball. And I think that probably stems from that thing of not wanting to commit turnovers. Um, the other part is like in this question, uh, he didn't see if, if evident improvement in pass selection. I get why you might say that, but from my perspective, and this is my opinion, I respectfully disagree because 
he was going through his reads and he was making the throw that would have got him to completion and got the ball into playmakers' hands for them to do for them to do what they do best, which is get yards and beat guys. And whether that and it just so happened that the plays only allowed him to get the checkdowns. Like we look at it, we look at Chase's stat line, and let me pull it up real quick. Um Chase's stat line, 25 of 38. One interception, 177 yards, one touchdown, a long of 28. I mean, is that better or is it like 15 of 30, two interceptions, like 200 yards, one touchdown, like with a long of 48? Like, is or is, is that better? I don't, I don't necessarily know if one or the other is better just because he's taking more risks or he's taking more shots or he's more willing to throw deep, or whatever it is. Like, he's doing what he is being coached to do and is telling him, like, hey, this is one, two, three, make the reads, nothing there, hit the check down, and then we'll take the two yards and we'll move on to the next play. I That's that's my understanding of how and what they're teaching them, like, just from the two weeks of, of fall camp that I saw. So if he's doing that, he's doing that effectively. I think the people that are saying that he's not going to reads – respectfully is absolutely wrong because if you go back and watch any of the tape you see his head on a swivel if his head is on a swivel that means he's going through his reads he's not just rubbernecking it and just like going left to right just for the fun of it like he that means he's actually making his progressions and getting to the check down because he knows the check down is going to be there no matter what so he's going through one or two or one two three or one two three four and then hitting the check down so unless you know final Final note on that too. All of that I thought was really well said, Rob. Let's not ignore the fact that we're talking about a quarterback that was in the cheese it bowl. We're, t- we're talking about a quarterback that lost his job and then got his job back to someone who was very turn like to someone who was very turnover prone. There's got to be some some ghosts in there, right? <laughs> there has to be like. Even in the best athletes, you're not going to remember the freaking cheese bowl. We remember it like it was yesterday. We talk about it all the time. What about the guy that threw the interceptions? How is he going to feel about it? There's going to be a propensity to not want to make that 50-50 throw. And it's just different, right? We have Davis Webb. Davis Webb would throw it all the time. Davis Webb, and he was okay with that. And he would have three touchdowns, two picks. I remember those stat lines like it was yesterday. And Davis Webb would just, he's, he's like, the gunslinger, you know, Texas gunslinger. You just throw it up there. Let this guy make the play. I think Chase has maybe, you know, gone a little too conservative with that. And the coaches say, hey, in this situation, dude, just throw it. Just make the throw. Kakoa's going to come down with it. Trevin Clark's going to come down with it. Jeremiah Hunter's going to come down with it. Let your guys go up and make the play. But to what you're saying too, Rob, is like make the smart play first. But then like, yeah, you know, take the shot. Take the shot. And that's just what we didn't see. That's what we wanted. Right. And w- once again... The slow burn. I think Chase is a slow burn type of guy. He starts. He's, it just. It's a slow burn. And. Yeah. I, it, I think. I think what you what you said is absolutely spot on. And like. We just have to make sure you, you find a, a, a fine like line and balance between the two. Because I don't think we can fully blame Chase on like not willing to take the deep shots. Or we can't also fully blame the staff like for for not telling Chase to take those deep shots. Like I think it, there there is a middle ground somewhere where like Chase is probably making those checkdowns because that's what he's being coached to do. But maybe there is also some propensity of the coaching staff needing to tell Chase to take some of those shots downfield. And it's yeah. it's not an either or situation. It's an and situation. Like both Always. both needs to happen. So that's why I'm not, I'm like yeah, do you think Chase is not that great? I, I get what you're saying, but I there's more nuance to that position, especially at quarterback, than there is at any other position, and especially in the in the methods that you're being coached. I think that's where we're at. I think that's a good wrap. That's a good place to end it. Um, what we always end with is what we call the victory cannon, but we're thinking of another name for it just because... We're going to have to bring this up when we lose, and it can't really be the victory cannon when we lose. So if you have any name suggestions, we'd absolutely love it. 
because Andy and I were thinking of names today. We were both exhausted from the weekend that we couldn't think of a single name. So for now, I couldn't. So for now, we'll just say it's the victory game. Um, but we just want to use like the the reason we have this set up is because we want to amplify things, whether it just be for fun or or necessity things that we think is for the betterment of the Cal community and our listeners. So that's why we want to keep this segment alive. So once again, if you have any ideas for names, tweet at us, DM us, email us, and uh, we'll pick we'll pick a good one uh, from what you guys send us. But for now, it's still the Victory Cannon. Andy, do you have anything to load into the Victory Cannon today? I think I do. Ooh, Ooh fancy. All right, I've talked about this enough. We talk about it all the time on this podcast. Ob Town Chicken. You refer to, we refer to it as Korean Fried Chicken, Ob Town Chicken, Ob Town, any of those varieties. And I want to spend one minute talking about this place because um, we have been going to this place since college. Our, Rob has been going since college. I am a little bit newer to the Ob Town family, and they have been marked as closed on Yelp, and it's incorrect. It was a viral thing. People said they were shutting down because somebody in a parking lot was getting it paved and they were doing renovations that said it was over. And please support this business. This is a local Asian-owned business. If you're in the East Bay, Bay Area, you're hungry. The food is so good. The service, you know, it's okay. Service, <laughs> not gonna lie. service can always be better like, at any point. It's, it's, it's just, you know, there's it's not perfect, but... As far as a place to go and support, it's a fantastic place. It's right off of Telegraph. It's right over by that KFC Taco Bell combo and uh, Williams Liquor, which is still there. Shout out Williams Liquor. Unbelievable that they're still in business, given the amount of times my friends and I went there as we were under 21. All right. So that's my, that's my victory cannon for today. Uh all right, my victory cannon for today. I think uh, I think Andy will uh, appreciate this one as well. Um, we had a fun one, so we'll do a little bit of a serious one. the 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 fires that are raging in California are no joke right now. If you live in the Bay Area, you 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 feel it, um, you smell it. You have everyone's like on air quality index like watch weekly, um, and there's a lot of places in Tahoe and elsewhere that you know is prime. For particularly this this coming winter, because of what happened with the pandemic last year, is a prime spot for tourism and like holidays and so on. And so there's a lot of good funds out there um, that you can donate to um, that would help out a bunch in those locations and set them up to prepare themselves to to receive some said tourists and holiday season to make back maybe a little bit of the financial downgrade that they took over like the last year and, and everything that the pandemic took away. Uh, so if you're able and willing, there's a bunch that you can get into. There's also a bunch of uh, food services that you can donate to because they're handing out food to the first responders and the firefighters that are out there um, and a lot of people being displaced. So I can't name specific ones, uh, but I would say it's pretty easy to do the research. Um, you can, I think, also go to the city of Reno's website. Um, I think the state of Nevada's like actual website. They have like donation listings um, where you can donate. Uh, and so if you're able, please do that and help out um, just a beautiful part of the northern California area that, you know, we all love and enjoy, but not enough. Yeah. Protect our winters is a great organization. Um, go check it out. And, uh, yeah, I think they said millions of dollars were lost this weekend mm -hmm. with labor day and not people not going up there because of the fact that the air quality is super bad and, um, uh, you know, evacuation routes need to be open all that type of stuff. So, uh, do whatever you can to support. And uh, that is it uh, for the Golden Bear Cast. You can find us on Twitter or on all your podcast networks. If you're listening to us, you found us. So I don't need to tell you where to find us on the podcast networks. Um, find us on Twitter at Golden Bear Cast. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Rob11HWNG. You can find Andy at Andy J. B. You can find all our written stuff at RightForCalifornia.com. Remember, we have a paid subscription service that we just started with some actually super cool articles with play breakdowns, PFF, uh, premium podcasts from there, and so on. 
So check that out. It is still in a trial uh, week. So you can actually get all of those for free without actually signing up. Uh, but everything else will be starting to go behind paywalls starting next week uh, after the TCU game. So be on the lookout for that and uh, take a look at redforcalifornia.com. And that's it for us. And as always, go Bears. Go Bears.